Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 14th of 2017. First up, this is from High Plains Public Radio. Uh, this last Monday, asteroid size of 10-story building passes between Earth and Moon. An unexpected sight appeared in the sky Monday evening as CNET reports an asteroid the size of a 10-story building passed halfway between the Earth and the Moon shortly after scientists at the Catalina Sky Survey first discovered it on Saturday. That's not a lot of warning time. This should be a, kind of like a call to uh, do a little bit more about uh, tracking these asteroids and stuff like that. But anyway, asteroid 201. 7 AG13 was from 36 to 111 feet across and traveling at a speed of 10 miles per second, but it wasn't big enough to cause extinction had it struck Earth, although damage similar to the 2013, uh, Chel I think it's Chelyabinsk meteor, the one that uh, we got to see on all those different uh, cameras, the different monitoring cameras around buildings and stuff like that, that it still created quite a bit of damage and stuff like that, so says, while the 100,000 mile distance from Earth seems far away, the flyby is considered close in a cosmic sense. Most asteroids pass by Earth at a distance several times the moon. So, uh, yeah, because of the asteroid's uh, speed and the dim brightness level of the asteroid, it was very difficult to track. So, say we had one like three or four times this size and only got a, a couple of weeks warning anyway, we'd pretty much be sunk. I mean, we just, we'd have to take the hit and hope it happened over an ocean, so... Uh, maybe a call to all the countries to chip in and something like, uh, you know, getting a little bit better survey done of objects around us and a way we can possibly divert them. Uh, this is from Popular Science. I was just skimming through Popular Science and thought this article was interesting. Why are there liquid nitrogen canisters on New York City sidewalks? I guess it's not just New York City sidewalks. I guess um, quite a few major cities that still have steam pipes running underneath use these nitrogen cables in there to keep... Uh, the uh, internet cable dry because of the fact the uh, uh, they're using old copper lines. Well, I'll just stop. I'll uh, read the article here. I had sporadically, this is the author talking, I had sporadically seen mysterious nitrogen canisters in New York City sidewalks and wondered what they were doing there. Each tank has a hose snaking its way into the manhole where it presumably dispenses nitrogen under the street. Luckily, popular science let me find out as part of my job. It turns out they're there to keep copper cables dry so phone and internet services can run smoothly. Verizon spokesman John Bono, Bonomo, I guess, or Bonomo, said the tanks supplement the country, the company's existing pressurized system to keep its cables dry when repairs are going on or there's too much steam present. The cables have a protective sheath around them, but sometimes it's not enough to keep them dry. But as durable as it is, it gets penetrated by the elements as well over time. So I guess also the small area, too, and the steam pipes also keep a lot of heat going down there too and this liquid nitrogen gas keeps it a little bit cooler. As the liquid nitrogen leaves the canister it turns into a gas. Um, this keeps cables at high enough pressure to keep moisture out. Two tanks at Madison Avenue and East 27th Street in Manhattan have been there for about a year because of steam buildup. I guess during winter time the steam pipes are used even more for heating the buildings and stuff like that. And he said the temperatures in these areas under the street can reach 220 degrees. Um, they're mostly used in Manhattan but uh, also, as if you read on down in the article, they're used in other places too. So maybe very likely if I strolled around in downtown Chicago. So eventually, I guess, as they switch and get uh, into optical cables to carry all the internet and phone and stuff like that through optical cables, there will not be a necessity to do this. But it says, according to this article, 21% of Americans still use DSL to access the internet. And that runs right over old straight copper wire sheathed cables. So for a while longer, they're going to be doing this. Uh, they said also, just by the way, too, that if people think the tanks are dangerous or something like that, they've had people actually hit into them with cars and knock them over, and they said the tanks are more than strong enough to take the uh, punishment, and usually some guy just shows up and tips them back up again, straps them in place, so they're claiming there's no real danger or anything. This was from my friend Tom H., and from uh, a site called NHK, um, NHK World, so... If you get a chance, check this out for other links, too. I didn't even know. This is a really good site for uh, lots of world news and things about science, and I didn't even realize it existed until Tom uh, sent me this. It's uh, news about Asia and Japan, mostly, but here's the title of the article. Japan launches mini-rocket. Japan's space agency has launched a mini-rocket, one of the smallest to go into space. 
The Japan Aerospace Agency says the rocket lifted off around 8.30 a.m. on Sunday local time from the Uchinora Space Center in southwestern Japan. I'm probably slaughtering that um, pronunciation. The rocket is only 9.5 meters long. It is carrying a microsatellite standing 35 centimeters long and weighing 3 kilograms. Governments and businesses around the world are investigating in microsatellites as cheaper and more advanced alternatives to conventional devices. I think somewhere else I read before in another similar article, this only costs several million dollars, which might sound like a lot, but for launching, I think you can launch something like about a seven, eight pound satellite. So uh, they're gonna launch a satellite, I guess, or this satellite they launched with this is to take some uh, pictures of uh, low, low Earth orbit pictures and stuff like that using a microsatellite. So maybe a cheaper, faster, easier way to do it. And if you do have a failure, at least it isn't going to cost so much to do it over again. And last up, this is from Scientific American. Infants should be fed peanuts to stave off allergies. Contrary to past guidance, new recommendations call for early introduction to peanuts. Federal health officials on Thursday issued new food allergy guidelines that could help reduce peanut allergies among children. And that, contrary to past guidance, Call for parents to give babies food containing peanuts as early as four to six months of age. The new guidelines from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, part of the National Institutes of Health, reflected an improved scientific understanding of the best ways to prevent the development of allergies. Uh, I totally understand that I actually have a peanut allergy myself. It's not a, a serious one, but if I eat too many just regular unprocessed peanuts, I get these red spots on my cheeks, and that's about all that happens in there. It's kind of itchy, too, And but it, the funny thing about it, like a lot of allergies, I can eat other forms of peanuts. I can eat all the peanut butter I want. I can eat other forms of processed peanuts in other ways, but after I eat about two big handfuls of peanuts, my face tends to break out. If I eat one handful or smaller amounts, it doesn't, so I don't have a serious allergy, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it says here, too, it even talks about severe eczema because of it, too. So a lot of people that have peanut allergies, contrary to popular beliefs, aren't going to die from eating them. Some will. I mean, there are some people with serious allergies and should totally avoid them. But for the uh, most part, it's just uh, an annoyance. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.